Hey everybody, we're going to be in Acts chapter 20 today. Uh, so turn there if you have a copy of God's Word or want to click on it on your phone, whatever. We'd love for you to follow along with God's Word. You may see the Spirit kind of draw you to different passages, both in the book of Acts and throughout the whole Word. Uh, we, we love that. We love when God just kind of zigzags everywhere and leads you on, on an adventure of your own during teachings like this. But we're going to focus on Acts chapter 20. If you remember, we've been in the book of Acts for most of the year 2020. Uh, and it's been a really Really cool sort of theme to dive into while we have so much chaos and unknowns and uncertainties where we are but you think about these apostles and what they're doing when they've just seen Jesus ascend and now they're living out these new realities with with not a lot of you know clarity not a lot of plans not a lot of organization so it's it's kind of cool to take cues from what the Holy Spirit did back then and learn to live in some of those ancient ways and so today especially is a really cool passage in Acts chapter 20 where we're gonna see Paul do something that's really relevant to our lives right now. Now, it's not going to be in regards to politics. I know we've been doing a few rounds of that the last few weeks. Super appreciate all the encouragement that I've heard back from pastors and individuals within communities. Just really love that uh, between what God has been doing in his own way in many different people's lives and what he's been using uh, the people of Radius to do in, in each other, it's been cool to see such healthy, mature, biblical-based dialogue about this political season. So uh, a lot more to go, I'm sure, in your own hearts as there's some fasting and prayer and decisions to be made in this sort of heightened political season. But uh, what we're going to handle, handle today is not going to be directly about the, the political realm we find ourselves in. So some of you might be like, thank goodness. Uh, so here you go. It's a gift to you. But what we are going to do is, is Paul's going to take this look right at his, at his life as he brings these elders together from Ephesus. He wants to say something to them. This, it's really going to be remarkable. It's going to be uh, one of the longest things we have recorded of any, Paul, of, any of Paul's speeches. This is something Luke uh, actually jotted down, I guess, as he was traveling with Paul. And he really records a big section of what he says to these people. And what's so fascinating about it is what we're about to look at is a, is a man who is processing a very introspective look at his own life. He, he knows his days are numbered. He knows the ministry at Ephesus is coming to an end. And he's looking at his life as a whole, as a totality, and asking big questions and saying big things about himself. And so this is a, a fascinating thing for us to dive into because we have been lulled in, many of us, into a way of thinking over the past few months where the world's kind of set these calendar events, these really short-sighted bursts of how we think. So if it's if it's in regards to something like COVID, you know, we've had a lot of conversations like it'll be done by Easter, right? Or it's summertime, that's it, right? Okay, fall, that's definitely. Okay, dark winter's coming, you know, and it's always these little short bursts where we're looking at this, this, this calendar event that we're hoping, man, if we can just get a little further, then it'll all be behind us. And so we've had some of this thinking sort of preset for us in a way that this can be refreshing to hear Paul talk about the totality of things. And other things have been like that too. Going into politics, you know, we've had this, this kind of, well, you know, there's this, this debate coming up and we're going to figure everything out after we see these two people debate. And then we watch it and we're like, okay, that was a little bit like toddlers yelling at each other. And then there's going to be another debate. Nope, canceled. Another debate. Ah, okay. You know, and so, okay, we'll wait till the election day. Then it's going to be solved. But we're, we're letting the world kind of set all these sort of calendar events that are important and they do mean something. But for us as believers, we want to be people who, who really let the Lord sort of set the most important parameters of how we think. You know, if you're inundated with like, you know, your mindset is just, I think we should wear masks when we sleep and when we shower and they should, you know, and somebody else is thinking, I'm only going to wear masks when they're mandated or encouraged. And that, that idea, that thing we call tribalism, it, the world sets that up. And there, there's a lot of space in this for us to not only figure out how we can both agree to disagree and rely on different data and different things, but also to, to really step out of that a little bit and say, you know, there, there are bigger things happening in the kingdom of God that we want to be identified by and known by. There's still very important things in the world, but how we go about maneuvering in the world is really founded upon the kingdom of God. And so Paul's going to do a really good job today in this, in this, uh, listen, I just like said, Paul's going to do a good job, right? Like as if I'm like, way to go, Paul. Um, I'll tell you if you get an A plus, Paul. But anyway, he, he's going to do, in my opinion, my little, my little opinion, I'm going to say, I think he does a good job for me personally 
helping break this cycle of the next world event, the next world parameter set. And instead, we're going to see him talk about his life in a very beautiful, holistic way that's super inspiring for me personally. So I hope you get something like that from it as well. We, we want to be defined by the things Paul's going to, going, to, going to let us hear about today. And those are very beautiful things. So let's pray. Let's pray that we'll receive what God has given us through his word and that we'll find great encouragement from it. Jesus, uh, we come to the scriptures and we ask for you to make these words, whether they're on our screen or in a book that we're looking at and seeing little pages bound, you know, whatever, wherever these words are, we believe that you, Jesus, are alive, that you're the word. And that you can somehow take these words and make them mean things and contextualize these things. Assign us, you know, clear applications in our lives. It may not be the same for the person we're sitting beside or the person that we're in relationship with. But we ask right now you'd give us something specific for each one of us. That we'd be caught up in this adventure of following you. That we would be able to discern what your spirit has for us right now. Use these precious words that you've left us with as a, as a launching pad into something that's clear and direct for each one of us to know how to walk along your path, Jesus. So in the name of Jesus, we all say, Amen. All right, Acts chapter 20. Let's uh, go into verse 17. We'll start there. I'm going to read like several chunks of this uh, speech. I'm not going to do all of it, but I'll get pretty far in, I hope, today. Acts chapter 20, verse 17. Now, um, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. Remember, this is Paul speaking. And uh, when they came to him, he said to them, okay, so this is Paul calling, just to give you context here, he's calling the elders from Ephesus to basically travel 60 odd miles and meet him in a nearby town. Now, some of the text before it kind of tells us this, some of the around surrounding context tells us this, but basically what Paul's doing is he's trying to get back to Jerusalem by, by a certain day because he wants to be back for the day of Pentecost. And that day is coming very soon. And he knows he can't just chill in Ephesus for four or five days and just hug everybody and holy kiss everybody and high five everybody and learn about all their lives, which I know he really wants to do. And he, he's clear that he loves and adores the people of Ephesus. But he knows he's going to get caught up in that. He will, he'll miss this other thing he feels like he's supposed to do. So he kind of stops about 60 miles away, a stop that he feels like he has to make, and basically says, hey, elders, if y'all want to come over here, we can have a, have a meeting, kind of a powwow, and really work together on the things that are essential together. And, and let, allow me to give a, a really good uh, goodbye to you guys, because he, he feels like he'll never see them again. And so he, he does this. He has this really short visit uh, with the elders. And this is kind of the compromise of his heart wanting to be with Ephesus, but his watch saying, I, we, we got to move. You know, we got to move, move and have this assignment here in Jerusalem. He says, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. Let's look at this, just this sentence and, and expound on it just a little bit. Uh, so Paul has spent significant time with the people in Ephesus, with the elders of Ephesus. These elders are probably each working with different churches. We'll kind of see some evidence of that in a minute. But they are, they're working with these spiritual communities, much like if you're part of Radius, we have these individual relational churches, and we have an elder that works with each church, uh, up to two to three churches each. And so we've actually tried to arrange this a lot like what we can uh, guesstimate was happening in the New Testament. So this is what's happening. Paul is meeting with these elders that are all in, like, in this role of loving on all the different churches in Ephesus. And he says, you know that I lived among you, you know, the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. And so this idea that Paul's saying, he doesn't start by saying, listen to what I've written you. Listen to what I want to tell you about your life. You know, li listen to all the teachings I've given you. He starts with this really cool idea of, you know me, like you've seen me. You know who I am as a person. You don't have to just listen to my words. You don't have to just read my letters. You know me. You've seen me. You understand how I live and how I operate in the kingdom of God. This is such a precious thing that he says to them, that he wants the people to know the character of Paul, the, the beliefs of Paul, not by just what he says, but by how he lives. And this is, this is really cool. As, as, as Paul is saying this introductory conversation to them, it's almost like this should maybe be something that's a model for all of us. 
that maybe we, we in, in, in light of what he's doing here, should really, as, as parents, we should be willing and ready and maybe uh, regularly doing this action of talking to our children and go, hey, you know, when you see mom and dad, when you see us live our lives, don't think about the, the, the things we tell you, the things we teach you. When you see our lives, what do you see? You know, just tell us, who do you think we are? You know, if you, if you imagine a few years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you're out of our house. What are the things you're going to remember about how we lived, about what really stands out, about what we're characterized by, our character? And maybe you want to think about uh, the coworkers, wherever you work. What would they say? Not the things that the, the verses that you have on the written around your desk or not the times you talk about going to church or the, the beliefs that you've maybe been bold enough to be able to share. But if they really looked at your character, who you are, what would they say? Have you allowed a space like Paul has allowed to really be with the people around you in such a way where you're really hoping that, that what happens is, is people start to not just see what's taught, but really what's caught by intimacy with you, but what's caught by being around you. Think about these ideas. Think about the next few weeks as we, maybe or maybe not because of COVID, are hopefully going to be around some of our family members, extended family at Thanksgiving, at Christmas, whatever. Have you ever just asked some of these people who, who've known you for years, hey, you know, what do you, what do you guys really see in me? You know, do, do you see the character of Christ in me? Is this something that, that you see? And if not, would, would, you, would you be cool just to, just to speak it honestly and tell me? Is that, I, I just want to know. Paul is, is setting himself up in this beautiful way to say, you know me. You know, I, don't, I don't have to give you theory here. You, you, you know me. And that's, that's pretty bold, right? To not just be caught up in ideas or theories, but go, I was with you all this time. I was with you in all these ways. So he says uh, in verse 19, Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is a, a really interesting passage. There's a lot kind of loaded into this. But let me, let me say this, that a lot of times when I think about my life, and I've told a lot of you this before, you know, I think about the end and I think about, you know, what are people going to say about me and what kind of comments will they say about the life of Stuart, you know? And sometimes I, I, I think as I've lived longer and learned a little bit more and, and realized how life goes and really looked at characters in the scriptures, um, what, I've, what I'm learning more and more is this. <clears throat> that some of the best ways that I have loved people probably haven't been appreciated by those people. And, and there are people who I think that I've probably tried to sacrifice for and love the hardest, you know, that <clears throat> right now, I don't know if they like me. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if they wouldn't say we, we really, that what you said and what you did, it just didn't, didn't like, didn't feel right. It didn't feel good. It didn't, didn't make them feel comfortable. But, and yet in, in the Lord, in Jesus, I would say I was loving you with a Jesus kind of love. It wasn't arrogance. It wasn't in myself trying to, I mean, that I have times where I do the wrong thing and say the wrong thing. I'm very self-focused, but there have been some very honest, Jesus-empowered, Holy Spirit-driven, deep, long, um, you know, extensive ways of loving people at times. And those people, they, they don't always get it. They don't always receive it as that. And so setting this idea of the love that we expend towards people being realized by those people, it's kind of an unrealistic thing. It's not true in the New Testament of a lot of leaders. They didn't, a lot of Paul's ministry was not people that high-fived him, you know, that we ever saw or heard of and said like, thanks for that thing you said to me that really offended me in the moment or really didn't really make me feel, you know, really warm and fuzzy. Thanks for saying it, you know. A lot of them, we just know they they tried to stone him or arrest him or flog him and we never hear of him again. We don't, we don't, we don't know. But Jesus knows. And that's what's so important in this is that Paul is able to understand as he, as he speaks in this way, he's able to speak in such a way where he's like, I know I loved you with a Jesus kind of love. I know I did. That is such a wonderful thing to know about yourself and to know how Jesus feels about you and to realize how people respond and, and what people do. And if they follow the truth you set out there, that can't be on us. 
Jesus doesn't even take that on him. And so to have fellowship with Jesus in, in pure and sincere love of another person without expecting that person to so much as even be grateful for that, there's something in life that seems right, that seems true and good about that. It's painful. It's hurtful. I can think of a situation years ago where someone was uh, wanting to go through a divorce. And uh, it wasn't a divorce for any substantial reason. It was just more of, we're just, this is kind of boring. You know, this is not what I want. It's not, not a fun marriage. And to their credit, it was not a great marriage, arguably was not even a good marriage. But it, was, it wasn't a marriage that couldn't have been redeemed. It wasn't a marriage that couldn't have been fought for. And, and the, the person wanting the divorce admittedly had not fought for it in a lot of ways. They just felt like it would be less tiring to go the exit door out of it. And so through much time, through much prayer, through much writing, much conversation, um, I, I pursued with as best of a Jesus kind of love as I know how, informed by the scriptures, I felt like empowered by the Spirit. I've looked back over that many, many times and thought, you know, there are always these things you can look back and say, I could have done better. But there's nothing substantial that I, that I felt like was grieving to God or to the Spirit. And, and as, as hard as I tried, this person just still went and did what they wanted to do, went, went forward and really denied some things that Jesus wanted for them, even though they claimed the name of Christianity. Now, this person, if I think about, if I, if I died, if I passed away, uh, I, I think this person would go to my funeral, right? But I don't, I don't think they would, they would look back at my life and I don't think they would say something like, we're really glad that Stuart loved so relentlessly. I think they still would probably say, you know, I wish you just let me do what I want to do. But I think Jesus would say, thank you. I think Jesus would say, that's it. Jesus would say, you, you did what I wanted you to do. You did it for my glory, as for Jesus' glory, right? Not for the glory of the other person saying thanks. So there's something to life. It's hard. I don't love it. You know, I don't think Paul did either. But there's something to life where you, you, you start to realize what's true. It's just true that, that you can love somebody super well. They don't have to say that it felt good. They don't have to like you for it. But it can still be true that you can love with a Jesus kind of love and feel all of your affirmation, all of your confidence in what you've done comes from Jesus and Jesus alone. It doesn't return void, right? I mean, Jesus, Jesus is going to, to reward you. He is, he is glorified by that. He wants to bless you because you loved with the kind of love that he has. It wasn't super rewarding for him by a lot of the people he was trying to love. They were the ones putting him on the cross. They were the ones killing him. And that's what he experienced and that's what we have to experience. So when we think about this, when we think about the idea of what actually happens here when, when, when he's looking at, at, at all these ways that he's given to them, I'm going to write some words down because I think these are really powerful concepts that when Paul looks at his life and he confidently can assess truths about how he's loved the people of Ephesus, here are some of the concepts he says. He basically says, I served. I served. He, he was a servant to them. He gave his life in that way. He served them. He says... He was humble. And I know this is, a, this is a hard one to say. I think we have this weird, almost deceitful thing from the enemy that if we say we're humble, then we're not, right? But Paul does say he's humble. And, and, and he's not rebuked for it. or he's, he's, I think he's, he's just talking honestly. I don't think in humility he's saying, pat myself on the back. I'm humble. I think he's saying, bless God. It was the Spirit of God through me that ever would allow such a thing. He doesn't qualify that every time, without, by every time he ever talks about something going, Jesus, 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 but he does enough. He does, he does enough to be able to read this text and go, he's not, he's not bragging on himself. He's being honest. And the implicit understanding of all that honesty is, 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 is it's fruit that came from abiding in Jesus. It's okay to, to give Jesus glory by being honest about ways that you have loved, that you have really allowed the fruit of the Spirit to be produced through you. It's, as long as your heart, as long as your mind, it's not about you, as long as it's not bragging, as long as it's not looking for accolades from people. Sometimes, we, in the other extreme, we can feel like we're just pieces of trash and we always miss it. And I think there's beauty to what Paul's doing here is being able to say, hey, as I look over this ministry, as I look over this person, these people, man, I really did my love for you in a humble way. He was sincere. He talks about the tears he has shed for people. Have you cried for somebody else? Have you pursued someone else? Even if they didn't know that you were that sincere, that they may have thought you're fake. You just want me to do what you want me to do. 
and, and, they, and they deny how much work you have done to love them and serve them. Paul knew he was sincere. He knew he had something that Jesus, before Jesus, he could say, I cried for them. The way you, Jesus, cried for Jerusalem, I cried for them. I cried for Ephesus. He was sincere. He suffered well. You know, we, we want to be able to look back in any ministry opportunity, any person we've loved, our whole life as a whole, and we want to say, did, did, did we suffer well? Did we journey through suffering in a way that the trials, the persecutions, the whatever, we, we, we accepted those and we went through those with Jesus, for Jesus. Next, um, what, what he spoke was a profitable truth. Profitable truth. This was the idea of what Paul wanted to be able to say to people and what he could look back over his life and say, I did say to people. Now, when we think about profitable truth, speaking profitable truth, what, what, is this, what does this look like for you? And when you think about your life right now, how you've ministered to other people through COVID, how your marriage, how your relationships, how everything's going for you right now. We live in a world that is not really able to say about themselves, I only speak profitable truth. We have a lot of people that don't know how to speak truth at all because the world is, is confused, the idea of what's real and what's not. There's not a lot of absolutes anymore. So truth is like the thing that you see three times in a row on social media, like that's true. Um, and that's not the way of Christianity, that's not the way of Christ. Christ is trying to draw us as believers to say, what is true? And then when you go to speak it, just because it's true, you don't have to say it. And so you have to speak what is profitable. And, and, you know, I, I, for the, I'm just a quick little aside to this. I, I think there are people within the network of Radius that, that I think we, it, would, it would do us really good to be able to ensure that what we are writing on social media to what we are saying to people in seasons with heightened, you know, like just traps to want to speak about people and say things about people and, and categorize people and stereotype people. I think this is, this is a good season to really scroll through social media and think about all your conversations and say, am I speaking truth that is profitable? Just because it's true does not mean, just because it's permissible to say does not mean it's beneficial to say. And so are, are, are we able to really live in a way where we're looking at the ways we speak and looking at how we're using social media, looking at, at how we're interacting with people and saying, we're going to be able to look back at our lives and say, we spoke what was profitable and true. Paul can. He can look back and he can say to these things very clearly. He can say, I declared to you what was profitable. I didn't shrink from that. And so for some of us, we have to, we have to, we have a little bit, you know, too much courage, right? We're so courageous. We're just willing to say anything and everything, write anything and everything as if we're just trying to, to, to express courage in a way that may not be wise. And other people have a lot of wisdom, but maybe need more courage, right? To be able to speak more things, to not shrink back from things. If you're seeing things go down around you, you're not enjoying some of the conversations of brothers and sisters around you in Christ and how they're speaking and processing about things. Maybe some more courage to speak in some profitable truth, ask some, some humble questions and say, hey, I, I heard you say this thing. Uh, could, could we process that more together? And so Paul was able to, to talk about his ministry in a way where he's not perfect, but he's able to look at the characterization of how he lived in a way that was beautiful. You know, it, it's not being dictated by politics. It's not being dictated by worldly kind of ideas. This is, this is Christ stuff here. This is, this is the, the way of Jesus. You know? And Paul's being able to look at himself and go like, I saw the way of Christ come through me. Next, the idea of, of using our gifts. Okay, I'm just going to write the word gifts here. And what I mean by that is, you know, Paul uh, had a certain gift or a certain uh, role that he played at times as a teacher. And so he's like, he said, I was able to go through different house churches, speak from house church to house church to house church, and encourage them and speak the truth to them and teach them, instruct them in different ways. And lastly, um, he, uh, he, he was able to preach the gospel. He was able to tell people the gospel, remind people of the gospel. And so the gospel main, remained pure to Paul and, and foundational to Paul. And he spoke it. He was able to speak the gospel to all these places wherever he went. Whenever he was talking to people, it was gospel, gospel, gospel. Do you know who Jesus is? Do you know what faith is? Uh, do, do you understand what he, is, what he has done for us? And so this is a wonderful thing that Paul's able to say about himself. Again, this is not bragging. 
Did to say these things is to say that the character and nature of Christ flowed through Paul, which is to say that the gospel actually worked. Jesus doesn't look at all this and go, Paul, take a shower, man. You're like all about yourself. Jesus looks at this and goes, you must all be all about me because this is not stuff that, <laughs> that, that the flesh really wants to do. This is not stuff that is easy. This is not stuff that is comfortable. But how great that Paul kept his aim on this and was able whether it be just the ministry in Ephesus or his life as a whole, to be able to say, you know, this is what I was about. In, in 10 years, if you're on the right side of the mask argument or the wrong side of the mask argument, I don't totally, as long as you're in, wherever you are, as long as you're there with a good conscience and a sincere heart and you're, you're trying to be wise about things, but you just happen to watch some doctors or listen to other doctors, in 10 years, I don't think this is going to make the list. That back in 2020, I picked the right side on the masks. That's what I did. I just, that doesn't fit beside these. That doesn't fit. It, it, this may be a way in which you handled the mask discussion, but that's not something that belongs on this list. You know, this list is what we want to major on. This is what we want to focus on and not get caught up in all these, these trite, in some cases, worldly things, in other cases, important worldly things, but that we're not crystal clear on all the time. These, you can know, these are, 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 are really big things to be able to look back at our lives and say, thank you, Jesus. Thanks for doing this. Verse 22, and now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there. He says, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me, but I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. This is what I love about this passage. I love about this passage that Paul is, is, is wise enough to say, my days are numbered. You know, and look, the Holy Spirit, I go from town to town. The Holy Spirit's pretty much telling me, Paul, you got a target on your back. You know, people are after you. You got to be ready for this. This may be the last, last hurrah for you. And Paul knows that and understands it. And what he's saying is, I've decided that my life is not, you know, something I want to hold tight. Maybe the way I would think about the way he's processing this is this. Either you're a person that when you think about your life, you're either driven by, by, by quantity of life or quality of life. And these are both obviously, you know, good things to, to consider, right? But, but which one really motivates you? Which one really drives you? If you're a quantity person, that, then obviously you think about, you just maybe dream about the idea of making it into your 80s and 90s, a long life. You know, you think about retirement, settling down, living long enough to be able to travel the world. And you have this, this idea in your mind that drives you, that is, try to extend life to be as long as it can be. And maybe a variation of that is that it's as comfortable as it could be. Because you've maybe defined some kind of like Americanized view or, 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 or flesh kind of driven view of, of even the quality of life. But, but if quality really drives you, by quality I mean biblical, like kingdom of God defining concepts of quality. Then, then what? here's probably the way you think is, because I would argue this is the way Paul thinks. I, I don't think Paul is obsessed with, with, with quantity. I don't think Paul's going, Lord, let me live another day. You know what I mean? I mean, and if he does, he's saying, because I have more to do for you. But he's not trying to like, like say, God, I've done your stuff. Let me have some me time. I think what he's trying to say and what he, what he seems to be driven by here is that he understands that our days here are numbered, that we're only going to live in this age for so long. But in the next age, we're going to be with God in such a way where, where there, there is no limit to the number of days. This is eternal life with God forever and ever and ever. And so instead of trying to maximize this to be as, as comfortable and as, as long standing as we can make it, Paul's like, we already have the quality thing in our back pocket. <laughs> I mean, the quantity thing in our back pocket. We're already going to be alive forever. <laughs> What's longer than forever? But this this age, here and now, we have to really ask ourselves deep, question, deep questions about what does quality look like? What do we want to do with this life? And for Paul, what he's decided is, is to offer his life as a living sacrifice. To, to say, Lord, whatever brings you glory, I'll do it. That's what he has decided, that, that he wants to be sure that he finishes the course 
That's quality, right? He wants to make sure he runs the race the way we're supposed to run it. That's what he's obsessed with. Not the difficulty, not how short his race is going to be, but it's the race set for him. You know, my daughter, Ella, has been running cross country for her high school career. And so we've watched many different races. And, um, you know, and I'm the type of dad that, you know, if, if probably most any other thing out there, you know, any other sport, any other performance my kids do, if they're going to hop back in the car afterwards, I'm going to have this moment where I'm like, hey, um, really good job. You know, here's what you did really, really well. And if they're in a place where they're open to this or they ask me especially and they want me to like critically analyze things that they might could improve on, not as a way of going like, please, your daddy, but more in a way of going like, hey, if you want to get better, then, then if I can help you, a lot of times I can't. But if, if something I can see or notice from an observer or I've, I've done this thing before, I'll offer you some advice, take it or leave it. Um, cool. But you know, when Ella gets back in the car after our cr cross country race, I, I rarely ever <laughs> have anything like critical to say, you know, very much because my, my, my theory is this, if you get out there and you just run right for, for three miles. Okay. And, and nothing scary is behind you and there's no like hundred dollar bill in front of you and you're just running. I'm just like, good. I mean, I don't have anything negative to say. You're, you're more driven than 99.9% .9 of the population because you just ran for the sake of running. And there wasn't even like a peer team, you know, pass the ball. You just, you just ran for the sake of running. You know, I'm just like, high five. all right, that's cool. That's cool with me. You're, you're next level to me. But yet, even without me like pushing or saying, you know, aim for this, get better. It's been awesome to see how my daughter through all these years, she, she understands her course, right? She understands what, what she is aimed at doing. And so she sets these individual goals and, and she just finished after all these years of running. She just did her last race in her fastest time ever, you know, because she kept improving and getting better and running the course that is for her running with this, this excitement. And that's the coolest thing. When she finished it, she was like, I'm going to miss this. I love this. I, I love incrementally getting better and doing, you know, what, what I'm built to do and what I'm supposed to do in my races. It, it's so cool. And that's the idea what Paul is capturing here is he wants to listen to what, to what God is giving him and his assignments and his instructions for how to live. What is the course for Paul? And how does he make every day kind of a new way of obeying a new thing the Holy Spirit has for him? And if he can, he can look back and he can actually say, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm getting close to finishing my course. So far I've been running it, but I want to make sure the last leg, I, I, I want to run this thing exactly the way that God has for me to run it. What a really special thing that Paul can say about his life. Don't we want to be able to say that? You know, when we look back in years from now over this little section of COVID we're in right now, you know, do we want to look back in 10 years and say we did this like everybody else did it? We, we, we survived, you know, we sustained, we, uh, we, we said all the things everybody else says that it's hard and it's, you know, un unknown and, and, you know, be, we're inside more and quarantine. Those are realities. They're hard. We have to, we have to face all that, right? I'm not saying, you know, ignore that. It's, it's difficult. We accept that. But is there a course that God has for us right now through this affliction that's more than just it's inconvenient, more than it's frustrating? Is there something God has that if we would take our life and put it on the altar and say, God, I'm not trying to complain about the things that aren't as easy anymore. I'm trying to say in this suffering, in this difficulty, what do you have for me? What's my course? How can I grow in maturity? How can I be what you're calling me to be? Verse 25, and now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. It's a bold statement. He says, therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease day or night to admonish every one with tears. I love that. I love that what Paul's saying here is that it's not theory for him. That he's fought this, this, these battles. He has, he has been courageous in these fights. He has seen 
these wolves. He's, he's had hard things happen to him. And so to inspire these elders is not just to say like, all right, guys, you know, take up your cross. I've never taken up one, but you take up your cross because Jesus said to, but I'll just be here kind of, I'll step back a little bit. Jesus had a cross and you're going to have a cross. I'll just step back. I'll be the teacher. He's able to step in it and go, I have had people after me. I have tasted and seen the difficulty of the ground level, nitty gritty reality of loving people. And he's able to say it so powerfully that he's like, I'm actually concerned that y'all don't know yet, you know, like, like what I've been able to see because I'm so ground level with this thing that I want to warn you. I want to inspire you and encourage you that you're going to have some difficult things ahead of you. That's, that is something I've always admired about Radius as a whole and the elders, especially how people have allowed me for now 12, almost 13 years of being part of this network. They've allowed me to do the necessities that I need to do for Radius to serve the people of Radius. But it's always been part of the ethic of how we operate on staff. And, and for me being you know, full-time especially, of just everybody knows this, understands this, and encourages this. That I would have a, a part of my life right? That is not, you know, radius 80 hours a week, but because that's not reproducible to everyone. nobody else. Well, has exactly the same kind of circumstances that I live in, where you get to bounce from meeting to meeting or Voxer to Voxer or phone call to phone call. And everybody just wants to talk about Jesus. You know, that's not reality for a lot of us, you know? So I have a section of my life that I've always sort of sectioned off and said, this is the, the normal part of me, right? This is the part of me where I know my neighbors, where I take, you know, a section of time, part of my week, and I do hard manual labor and I, you know, cut my thumb or I hit my head with a board, true story. So I have a little cut right there. Uh, I, I, I do those things. And I do those things uh, to, to evangelize, to share the gospel, to make disciples. And I, I go fishing for people to love just like anybody else goes fishing for people to love. And honestly, on the whole, over the last 12 years, I pick up far more people in discipleship from everyday angles of ground level love of neighbor than I do with Radius. Because so much of the stuff at Radius where it's like, you know, if it's a Sunday night and I'm on stage, if it's right now and I'm not on stage, uh, but I am on the other side of a camera, you know, then this is not reproducible for a lot of people. We, people go like, you know, so so people come up and, and, and want to talk with me. I, I oftentimes, that's why I love having communities because people can all then disciple different people in relational settings. But this idea of like staying on the ground level, never giving up on just the reality, the ebb and flow of what real life interactions are. This is what Paul was good at. And I haven't been able to master a lot of things Paul has done, but by the grace of God and the, and the, um, the awesomeness of people at Radius, people understand that and fight for that to make sure we are always honest and, and full of integrity in how we think and see and live life together. It's a great feeling. It's a great thing for me personally and my own spiritual health. And I think for a lot of other people to see, you know, we really are doing this thing. It's, there's no hidden curtain somewhere. There's no, there's no secret, you know, back lives that no one's ever going to find out about. That is, that's not reality for us. We, we are, the reality is we are living real lives in this stuff. And it's, and it's true and it's real and it's good. Last section, verse 32. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Uh, that's cool. He's like, I didn't like anybody's dress shirt. Okay. I wasn't, I, w I wouldn't dig in his jeans. Okay. That is kind of a random statement there because I coveted no one's sil silver, gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the word of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So I want to say this is a final thought. Um, <clears throat> it is a privilege to, for me, and I think for many others that are part of this network, to be able to be around people that live in this radically countercultural anti-flesh, you know, anti-self kind of way where we really do believe that not that we just ought to give and we ought not to receive. That's not what we, that's not what we believe. We believe it's better, right? It is, it is like more favorable, more desirable. It is, it is a greater reward to, to give 
to people, you know, to, to, to love people, to serve people, to treasure people more than ourselves. It actually, it's not just this thing where we have water in our tank and we give it away and now we're really tired, you know. No, the more we give, the more we honor the image of God in people, the more the Holy Spirit becomes this wellspring of living water within us. And we're not tired all the time. We're not poured out all the time. The more we try to pour out, we can't outdo the volume of the wellspring of the Holy Spirit in us that gives us more, right? Because it's better to give than to receive. It's how we were created, how we were made. And through the gospel, we can, we can be remade into that image where we have a way of interacting with people in this way. Do, do you believe that if someone in your community uh, lost their job <coughs> and needed money and couldn't pay their mortgage, do you really believe that it would be better to give to them than to keep it for yourself? And, and if that was you, do you really believe you're surrounded by people right now that they would prefer to give their money to you than to keep it themselves? If you believe that, if you know that to be true, listen, I don't know how you can't just get on your knees or, or just spend some time today blessing God, that you are around some people who've learned to love with a Jesus kind of love. For those of you who went and helped out the O-Rigs over the last few weeks or who've, who've cooked a meal and delivered it to somebody, and for those who've uh, helped out financially to people like Sun Sun right now, and you know when you dig down, that wasn't a chore for you. It, 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 was, it was pleasure. It was desirable. It was, it was gratifying. You felt like you got more out of that than you gave. That's a beautiful thing. And this has always been the dream. Of, of Radius as a network. It's always been the dream that we would find ourselves not with people that are obsessing over meeting times or programs or translations of the Bible that we prefer or don't or endless theological discussions, but we would find people that learn to be so drawn to the, to the selflessness of the way of Christ, first in Christ Himself, who gave his body and bought us with a price so that we could have the greatest gift of all, intimacy with God. But then to find little versions of that, where that's what people desire to do. They don't need to be told. They don't need to be ordered around. They just see within each individual church, pastors and leaders, mature people, who this has become how they have realized the best possible way to live expresses itself. And so my, my, my dream, our dream, elders' dreams, I think we've all been loving, is the idea that more and more people, neighbors, would come into these churches and see this way, lived out in three dimensions, and they'd be so attracted to it, not just the information, but the imitation. And they would see this way of living, the way Ephesus, the way these elders, way back before they were elders, when they, before they were believers, they got to see this in Paul. They got to see how he lived and how he, how he helped the weak. They were the weak, you know, and how he gave to them. And he didn't do it because he ought to. He did it because it was his joy, the same way Christ gave his life for us. Maybe you just need to be encouraged right now and inspired that, you're, that, that this way of Jesus, it works. It's beautiful. It's good. I, for one, am finding so much life in it, and so many other people are too. And, and, and maybe you just, you just need to know that, you know, there's something more than all this stuff on TV and in social media and what everybody's talking about in the world. There's something more. There's something more that is Jesus and it's the way Jesus lives and the kingdom of, of, of heaven that he wants to put inside of us. And maybe some of us just need to hear right now that you're not alone in this. You may feel like you're alone, but many of us. I, I'm visiting communities the last few weeks, quite a, quite a number of them I've been able to really tap into and hear person after person, community after community testify to the power of Jesus. So don't forget that. Be encouraged. Be inspired. Let the words of Paul draw you to a bigger, more total, more, more long-standing way of thinking about our lives and how we live them. The world is filled with a lot of darkness, a lot of confusion, a lot of division right now. But Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever.